Chapter 2, Pests and Problem Diagnosis. This presentation will give you a brief introduction to identifying pests and other factors that cause damage on landscape plants. Knowing the cause of damage is important for determining whether or not a pesticide is required and, if one is needed, which one would be effective. When people see a plant that looks unhealthy, they often jump to the conclusion that it's been damaged by a pest. Pests are living organisms that damage plants and may include insects, rodents, fungi, bacteria, or snails and slugs. However, there are many non-living or abiotic factors that damage plants as well. These include poor water management, nutrient deficiencies, mineral toxicities, fertilizer damage, herbicide damage, or mechanical injuries such as getting hit by a truck or root pruning during construction. In this presentation, we will talk about the various causes of plant damage. In many cases, the damage caused by one factor may look similar to that caused by something else. For instance, the photos on this screen show leaves that have been curled on two different trees. However, the cause of that curling is not the same. The cherry leaves at top have been curled by aphids, while the curling in the sycamore leaves at bottom was due to herbicide. In order to properly manage problems in landscapes, you must be able to identify the cause. Here are three examples of damaged lawns. Brown, yellow, or dead spots in lawns may have many causes. Don't assume they're caused by insects or disease. Three causes are shown here. Fertilizer burn at top, herbicide burn under the playset, and damage due to fungal disease at the bottom. Poor water management can cause dead spots in lawns as well. If you apply pesticides when the cause of damage is a leaky sprinkler head or fertilizer burn, you will not fix the problem, and you will have wasted time and money. Diagnosing problems can be difficult. Before treating for a pest, you need to confirm that the pest is causing the damage and also that the pest is still present. Damage is often caused by poor cultural practices, such as poor water management, such as the standing water around the tree trunk at top. Sometimes there may be more than one factor causing the damage. In order to diagnose a problem, you must have a history of fertilizer, herbicide, and water application, and also check carefully for signs of insects or pathogens. If significant numbers of pests are not found, the problem was probably caused by a non-living or abiotic disorder. If damaged symptoms develop suddenly and don't spread over time, this can be another sign that the problem isn't caused by a living pest. You may need to check a pest or plant problem identification book or internet site or take the problem to an expert to identify. Never treat until you've properly diagnosed the problem. The most common groups of pests causing damage in landscapes are shown here. They include plant pathogens, which are microorganisms like fungi, bacteria, or viruses that cause disease in plants. The next group is invertebrates, which are animals without backbones, such as insects, mites, and snails. Vertebrates are another group of pests, which include gophers and moles. And finally, weeds, which include any unwanted plants growing in the landscape. Let's talk about how to identify pests in each of these groups. When trying to diagnose a problem caused by an insect pest, it's important to be aware of the type of mouth parts the insect has. Insects with chewing mouth parts make distinct holes in leaves, fruit, or flowers or stems. Examples of insects with chewing mouth parts include beetles, caterpillars, grasshoppers, and earwigs. Sucking insects, like the stink bug pictured here, have tubular mouth parts that they insert into the plant to suck up sap. Insects with these types of mouth parts cause leaves to curl or discolor. They often leave honeydew or sticky black excrement spots. They do not chew holes in leaves or other plant parts. Insects with sucking mouth parts include aphids, leafhoppers, mealybugs, scales, true bugs such as stink bugs, and whiteflies. 
Let's look at some common insect pests with chewing mouth parts that you should learn to recognize. Caterpillars are the larvae or immatures of butterflies and moths. They come in many colors and sizes and may attack any succulent part of the plant, including leaves, buds, flowers, fruit, or roots. Earwigs have pinchers at their tail end, but these cannot hurt people. They feed on leaves, shoots, flowers, and soft fruit. The black vine weevil adult feeds on leaves on plants such as rhododendrons. Its larvae feed on plant roots. Lawn grubs are the larvae of beetles, such as the mass chafer. Grubs feed on turf roots. Feeding can be so extensive that the lawn can be rolled up like a carpet. Grasshoppers feed on a variety of plants and usually aren't major pests except where landscapes are next to agricultural or uncultivated lands. There are many types of insects with sucking mouth parts. Let's look at some of the most common types. Aphids are small, pear-shaped insects that feed on many plants and produce a lot of honeydew. Scale insects spend most of their lives hidden under a disc-like covering or scale. They have no visible antennae or legs and can't move most of the time. There are two major groups of scales. Armored scales are smaller and flattened. Soft scales are more bulbous and produce honeydew. Scales are mostly pests of trees and shrubs. Mealybugs are waxy, segmented insects that feed on a variety of plants and produce honeydew. Whiteflies are tiny insects. Adults have powdery white wings. Nymphs are oval and, like scales, don't move very much. Whiteflies usually occur in groups. Leafhoppers may cause yellow stippling on some plants, but usually do not cause serious damage. Here are some other invertebrates that occur in landscapes that you should be able to recognize. These include ants, which serve many beneficial functions in the landscape, such as eating some pests, but they can also be pests themselves, usually when they protect aphids and other insects from their natural enemies. Snails and slugs are mollusks. They chew irregular holes in leaves and other succulent plant parts. They often feed at night, but leave a silvery trail of mucus behind. Spider mites are very tiny arachnids, which cause speckling on leaves. When there are lots of them, they often leave webbing, which is how they get their name, spider mites. Weeds are unwanted plants in the landscape. There are many, many weed species, but they can all be classified into one of three major groups. Broadleaves have wide to narrow leaves with net-like veins. Grasses have narrow leaves arranged in sets of two. Stems are rounded or flattened. Sedges look like grasses. However, their leaves and flowers are arranged in sets of threes, and their stems are triangular in cross-section. Knowing how long a weed will live is important in deciding how best to manage it. Annual weeds live less than a year. They produce seeds and then die out. Winter annual weeds germinate in fall and set seed in the spring. Summer annual weeds germinate in the spring and set seed in the summertime. Perennial weeds live longer than a year. Although the tops of perennials often die back, plant stays alive in sturdy underground stems, bulbs, or other vegetative structures that send out new shoots the next spring. Because these vegetative structures are hard to kill, perennial weeds are much more difficult to control than annual weeds. There are several types of vegetative structures that allow perennial plants to survive when growing conditions are not good. All of these structures can also sprout new plants and help spread the weeds. Yellow nut sedge has tubers, which grow from roots. Bermuda buttercup or oxalis has bulbs. New plants emerge from the bulbs each year. Bermuda grass spreads through above-ground stems that grow horizontally. 
These are called stolons. If you cut them up, new plants can grow from the stolon. Johnson grass has underground stems that function in the same way. These underground stems are called rhizomes. If you chop up these structures with a rototiller or a hoe, you may create even more serious problems because new plants can grow from the vegetative structures. They can also be moved with soil to infest new locations. Plant diseases can be caused by many microorganisms, including viruses, fungi, and bacteria. These disease-causing organisms are called plant pathogens. Symptoms vary greatly depending on the pathogen and the plant, but they may include leaf discoloration or distortion, powdery growth, dieback of plant parts. Some pathogens attack plant roots, trunks, and crowns, causing wilting, dieback, or death. Because the microorganisms causing plant disease are so small, it's often difficult to identify the cause of the injury in the field. Microorganisms often live inside the plant and cause general symptoms such as wilting that can be caused by a variety of organisms or abiotic factors. Some plant pathogens can only be seen with a microscope or may require a laboratory test to positively identify them. You may need to take your samples to your University of California Cooperative Extension Office or to other experts to diagnose the cause. Learn how to handle samples for disease diagnosis. One of the most common plant diseases seen in landscapes is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew occurs on many plants, especially roses, crepe myrtle, sycamore, euronymus, and can be caused by several species of fungi. The disease is distinguished by white powdery growth on leaves and shoots. On rose, powdery mildew is favored by shade. Rose plants grown in the sun are less likely to get the disease. For most of these plants, you could purchase less susceptible varieties that are less likely to show symptoms. Hundreds of different pests may occur in the landscapes you manage. You can't be expected to recognize all of them. Several resources from the University of California will help you identify pests, including the Landscape Pest Identification Cards and the book, Pests of Landscape Trees and Shrubs. You can also get expert help from your county cooperative extension office or your county agricultural commissioner's office. The agricultural commissioner's office will send samples of any exotic or unusual pests to the California Department of Food and Agriculture Pest Identification Lab for identification. This is the end of the presentation for Chapter 2, Pests and Problem Diagnosis. This would be a good time for you to do the exercises for Chapter 2 in the workbook and review the sample exam questions in the workbook or the study guide for Chapter 2.